Hi, good morning. My name is Amit Pundir. Welcome to this ELC session on the maintenance of development boards in Android open source project repo. But before we proceed, a quick disclaimer on the trademarks and copyrights, because I've used names and logos and I've referred many names and logos in the document. So just to avoid the copyright and trademark issues. My name is Amit Pundis. I work as a senior engineer in Lenaro. My primary role is AOSP bring up and maintenance on development boards. I've been doing this for the last 10 plus years. And you can find me on IRC on these channels. The agenda of this session today is to look into the realities of AOSP development and maintenance on the development boards. We will start with a quick overview of the dev boards usage in AOSP and the role Linaro plays in that. Then we will dig into the technical pain points of maintaining AOSP on the dev boards, be it dealing with subtle AOSP breakages or keeping up with the upstream projects. And then a quick slide on different device build configurations that we play around with. So this is what the AOSP reference board page looks like today. Reference boards or development boards are hardware platforms that are used as a reference for developing and testing AOSP. These reference boards provide a starting point for device manufacturers to build their own device. The current list of AOSP reference boards list Qualcomm Dragon Board 845C and Robotics Board RB5, both of which are maintained and supported by Linaro with the help of AOSP developers and Linaro's Qualcomm lending team. Now, what roles do the development boards play in AOSP? And why do we or why should upstream developers care? So this is our standard template. And if you have attended or watched similar talks from my Linaro teammates, then at previous ELCs or plumbers, then this will look familiar to you. Now, the short answer to this question is that the development boards serve as a test platform for AOSP developers to smoke test or benchmark their features, not just with upstream projects, but across multiple associative boards that they do support. And similarly, for upstream developers to test their changes with AOSP and catch and fix regressions promptly. And over the years, we have successfully demonstrated that the dev boards are essential tools in the AOSP development process. Be it facilitating, facilitating hardware compatibility or system integration, or just serving as a reference platform for Android device manufacturers. To begin with, it is crucial to thoroughly research and choose a dev board for AOSP development. It can be chosen on a number of factors like relevance to AOSP, that the board can keep up with the AOSP requirements and the AOSP development pace. And here I'm not comparing development boards with production devices because the boards may lack support for certain hardware components that limit the AOSP functionality. And it is not a fair comparison anyway. But near flagship SOCs help they help run smooth AOSP smoothly over the number of years. And there are less chances of performance issues or difficulties in running resource intensive applications. Other factors include upstream support, which helps deliver long time, sorry, long term software and security updates. Next up is active community and documentation. Uh, limited user base or outdated documentation makes it hard and challenging to set up or configure AOSP properly. So the, key, so the key takeaways are choose a dev board that is well supported upstream, has an active community, and provide up-to-date documentation and software support. On to the next topic of Linaro dev boards and AOSP, we will take a quick look at the role that Linaro plays as an Android ecosystem influencer. I'm guessing most of us here are already familiar with Linaro. Uh, we are an upstream first organization and focus on the development of open source software on ARM architecture, and that includes AOSP. 
So let us support ASP on a variety of member development boards and provide up-to-date software support, ensuring that the latest version of Android open source project and Android release can be installed and run on them. I'll circle back to difference between Android release and Android open source project later in my slides. And to ensure that Android operating system runs smoothly and efficiently on these dev boards, we perform extensive testing coverage on the dev boards which we support. It includes functional testing, it includes performance testing, as well as CTS and VTS compatibility test runs. And to ensure that the dev boards meet the requirements of Android compatibility definition document, we follow all the vendor guidelines. Again, I can't stress enough on the extensive testing that we do on our dev boards. And these numbers are just Android or AOSP specific numbers, and they do not include non-Android testing that we do on these dev boards. Overall, we test 13 Android kernel combinations across four user space in LKFT. You can take a closer and more detailed look at LKFT test combinations at android.dinaro.org. Now, moving on to the next set of topics, keeping up with AOSP code base. Uh, the AOSP is constantly evolving, adding new features, providing new bug fixes, and security patches being added regularly. Keeping up with these updates and integrating them with any local modifications which you may have can be challenging at times. So I'll be touching on a few common pain points which we usually run into. But before, just like we talked about choosing the right hardware for our device or project, choosing the right source code base for your device or project is equally important too. Now in the Android ecosystem, Android release and Android open source project, they're totally distinct concepts. They're related, but totally distinct concepts. And Android release, uh, release tag refers to a specific version of Android operating system. It represents major updates to Android platform, new features, new bug fixes. We are all hopefully familiar with how Android releases work. And they serve as a stable software reference stack for application developers. Now, this is something which may or may not be guaranteed with AOSP. I'll tell you how. Right, sorry. Uh, so the AOSP, on the other hand, is an active development branch, and unlike Android release code drops, it serves as a foundation upon which future Android releases are built. Usually, new features land in AOSP first before they get shipped in uh, releases, but it's not a hard rule. So AOSP builds or for your devices help in making the device future ready to avoid any surprises during the next code drop. But being in active development also means that AOSP builds are more prone to regressions. Also an equally important point that AOSP do not come with vendor-specific optimizations, vendor-specific drivers or software enhancements that you get on production devices or commercial-grade devices. This lack of support can result in limited functionalities on your device reduce performance and difficulty in obtaining software updates. For our dev boards, we support AOSP and the relevant Android GSI and common kernel builds. Now back to the main topic in hand, that is keeping up with AOSP code base. In the next few slides, I'll share the common pitfalls that we run into. I'll start with the most common one, which is related to the repo sync or code synchronization. Right. At times, we run into random build failures, random runtime failures, which are totally unrelated to what you are working on. And most of the time, it is the repo sync which has gone bad. You were syncing the, you were uh, synchronizing the code with upstream at not fortunate time. So it is advisable to resync the sources after some time or wait for internal pre-submit test to kick in. And if there are any obvious issues, then they will get rectified promptly within AOSP. 
Uh, if it is not, if the issue still persists, then that means the issue is with your device configuration or it is something which your device is not doing correctly. For example, some core framework changes need device configuration tweaks and most recent such failures or breakages on our devices happen when last time AOSP was moving from HIDL HALS to AIDL HALS. So we had to fix our device manifests accordingly. Uh, speaking of device manifests, the truth is that even after so many years of tinkering with Android devices, I don't think I fully understand how these FCM device manifests and compatibility matrices work. So maybe I'll pay more attention to it next time. But honestly, it is just uh, easier to see how Cuttlefish is dealing with those core framework changes. I mean, that's what we do, right? Just, keep it, just copy those changes over to your device config and see if that helps. And if that helps, then you keep tinkering with those configurations based on, I mean, according to your hardware. Uh, keeping up with ever-changing build configuration tools can be a pain too. Uh, the moment you learn Android.mk, they have Android.bp now. And now that Android.blueprint started to make sense, everyone is moving to Bazel. So, yeah. so the latest is that the whole of AOSP is now moving towards Bazel and it brings certain benefits like lower incremental build times and the builds are more hermetic in nature. Next up is the feature dependency on out of tree Android common kernel patches. Over the years, this dependency has come down significantly, but it is still there. A quick note here is that it is still possible to boot vanilla Linux or LTS maybe if you are on your hardware platform, if it is fully supported upstream. But if you are fine with booting with SE Linux in permissive mode and can live without couple of features like ADB remount and metadata encryption because these patches are still outstanding. Forever changing boot image header version requirements are again something which I want to bring up here. Changing partition layouts, boot image header versions, they require some bootloader, some deep bootloader changes. And from a, develop, some, from a development board point of view or from a device, from a legacy device point of view, vendors rarely care about bootloaders. I mean, they have shipped with one set of bootloader. Now it is up to you how you want to deal with that. If you are lucky, you have the source code like ABL, U-boot, and you can play around. You can develop the feature. If you are not, then it's a painful exercise. I mean, there are workarounds. We have worked around on few of our devices but it's good to have uh, less number of changes in bootloaders and boot image header versions. They just love to throw in a new partition every new release now. Okay, so um, troubleshooting GKI boot failures is next in my to-do list. It's next in my uh, list. Although almost all of these changes are vendor kernel issues and nothing to do with GKI as such. But I, I thought it's a good idea to share the most common GKI boot failures that we run into. Especially during the GKI development cycle when the KBI is still in the development and it has not frozen. Top in the list is system list, uh, symbol list modifications. Now, out of three drivers are, sorry, uh, Right. So the out of three drivers are only allowed to use a subset of exported kernel symbols. Not all exported kernel symbols upstream are allowed to be used by the vendors. So they have been maintained as a symbol list. And every out of three driver has to stick to that list. Or if they are adding a new symbol in the list, then they have to come up with proper justification just to keep the attack surface intact. But if the KABI is not frozen, then if some vendor symbols get removed from the list and your out of T driver depends on that, then you can run into boot regressions. Again, something which is device specific and GKI, which is like 
pure upstream and not pure upstream but close to upstream they do not care about that next up is protected kernel modules vendors shipping protected kernel modules run into boot failures as well the protected kernel modules are the upstream drivers upstream driver modules which are signed by gki and vendors are not allowed to ship their own version of that stack so it's an upstream stack and just to make sure that vendors do not play with that GK, uh, gki add signatures to the module and if you are not using that particular module and using some other module then you will run into boot issues and then there is one instance of gki config breakage worth mentioning here it has happened only once with me i don't know how frequent it is that uh, while transitioning from gki 1.0 to 2.0 uh, certain configs got removed again to check the attack surface there and uh, the firmware the user space firmware loader support got removed so the drivers which depend on the user space firmware loader they broke because the, the that config was missing now the workaround which we had that for uh, which we had for that problem is that now we are ship those drivers are I won't say broken, but those drivers still behave the same way. They invoke the user space firmware loader and uh, load the firmware. But since this config is removed in GKI, we are shipping those firmware binaries in RAM disk. So the moment the driver loads, it finds the uh, firmware in the RAM disk. Now, other than these technical challenges, there could be non-technical hurdles while dealing with OSP as well. Uh, one worth mentioning here is the po policy change around how the firmware binary blobs are handled in AOSP. It kicked in last year where AOSP uh, uh, sent to all, uh, said to all development board uh, vendors that they will not be hosting any firmware binary blobs, vendor firmware binary blobs in AOSP because of licensing constraints. Even though those binaries are redistributable in nature and are already part of Linux firmware. But as long as, uh, so the policy is that as long as they cannot rebuild the binaries, they cannot host it in AOSP to avoid any legal issues. So that has made AOSP develop, uh, dev board vendors like Linaro to switch to their own firmware hosting mode and provide an additional step and additional uh, build scripts to download the firmware binaries before building uh, AOSP for the devices. Now, uh, keeping up with the relevant upstream projects, one of the most important aspect of supporting a device in a project as big as AOSP is to keep up with always churning changes. We have already seen how uh, the changes in AOSP affect uh, devices, uh, dev boards, functionalities. Keeping track of external projects is equally important too. If you are, I mean, everyone uses Linux, so yeah, you are, you have to keep track of that project. Uh, in my experience, in the context of this talk, I will only mention Linux and uh, Open Graphics, Mesa and Fluidreno. Uh, but the list can go on and on, depending on the features being supported on your device. Right, so working with upstream Linux kernel or LTS and AOSP bring many long-term benefits, but it can be a pain too. So I'll start with the one which we frequently get bitten with. This is that upstream do not count device tree node names and sysfs entries as stable interfaces. And these names and entries get renamed more often than not, and hence breaking AOSP. I, I mean, for example, Mesa has dependencies on these device nodes. I mean, it reads and specific uh, these SysFS entries to uh, for their functionalities. And AOSP uses ASCII Linux, which has device level access controls. So every time a device node or SysFS entry gets renamed, we have to change our SysFS, uh, sorry, our SE Linux policies 
to tune into that change. I, I told you that most common examples are GPU and remote procs. The other important thing is the convincing upstream kernel developers that the bug you have reported is a valid bug. And it can get tricky too, at times. This is one of the frequent point of contention among AOSP developers and uh, upstream kernel developers. Sometimes we get lucky, I mean, we, you can convince the, develop, the, the developers that it's a uh, upstream breakage and you can reproduce it on AOSP or any other regular distribution. But sometimes it, we have to reproduce the bug on a regular Linux distribution and uh, show that, okay, this is definitely broken and this is how we have reproduced the bug to get some attention. It gets more and more difficult when a bug is tied to a firmware binary. If it is there on Linux firmware.git project, maybe you can talk to upstream developers and uh, figure out what is going wrong there. It gets tricky if it is a signed firmware binary, which, is, which has come from a vendor. And at times we have run into cases where some non-fatal regressions just go unanswered. I've listed down one example, which I think I reported a couple of years ago, and it's not a big deal, so I just skipped it. The other big project or the set of projects that we use or integrate on our Qualcomm uh, development boards is Freedreno, our open graphics stack. Integrating Freedreno in AOSP, it, build, it brings many benefits, enhances the stability, compatibility with newer code base, and it helps, and the most important point is that it helps increase the lifetime of the device beyond the original device manufacturer's support cycle. But like other upstream projects of any nature, Freedreno Mesa has its own limitations and pain points. Starting with a fairly regular build breakages with AOSP. Over the years, Roman from Glodroid has done some fantastic work keeping Mesa up to date with AOSP build stack. I mean, he got rid of the pre-builds which we use or which we used to use in uh, AOSP Mesa project. But the breakages tend to follow faster because it's an upstream project. And the, some recent ones that I have run into are due to host build tools version mismatch and some build some errors are due to deprecation of a supported library in AOSP. Uh, one upstream issue which is worth mentioning here is a particular Mesa runtime crash on AOSP uh, if you are using Mesa binaries built with AOSP. But if you use the Mesa binaries that, that's been built with Android GSI branches then they boot fine. So we did some, I mean, I have raised the issue upstream and we did some follow back with uh, upstream developers and uh, th there are things to do uh, on my plate. So right now it looks like LLVM 17 has some role to play in that breakage, in that breakage, but we'll see. Right, so uh, updating the AOSP external project. Yeah, so that if uh, you ever get to do that, it's again a vicious cycle. Uh, Mesa 3D project in AOSP is awfully outdated right now. And updating it to the latest upstream version or latest release is not a trivial exercise. I mean, we have done it in the past, updated the Mesa projects and other projects, but last time I tried to update this uh, particular project, uh, I gave up because lot of dependencies, internal patches, and I thought, just thought that instead of fixing that, I can just publish my own set of upstream binaries. Uh, in this one particular use case, fix stream, fixing upstream project was easy, but merging the changes back in AOSP got tricky because it uh, introduced a new set of SLinux denials, SLinux warnings in Cuttlefish. So we have to fix the cuttlefish warnings first, and 
then go back and do the merging. So it can get this way too. Last but not the least, uh, although Freedeno aims to provide comprehensive support for Adreno GPUs, and maybe cases where there may be cases where certain features or certain uh, advancements are or optimizations are not fully implemented. So this was certainly the case with Vulkan support on Fidreno. Uh, I'm not up to date on that. Maybe it is there now. Maybe it is not. But just one point I wanted to make. Right. So coming to the last set of slides, the AOSP provides a platform for developers to explore new features, new functionalities, and design concepts in addition to their own set of customizations and modifications that, that suit their specific needs and preferences. So other than chasing and fixing upstream or AOSP regressions, we also get to work with different device build configurations for different, different use cases. So this is just a summary of kind of work we do. Uh, bring up on newer or resource constrained SOCs. It gets challenging at times. Booting a minimal AOSP root FS with only console access, or booting with software rendering support while the GPU support is, only, is in progress, or be it experimenting with unified AOSP boot images so that one set of AOSP boot images can boot on n number of uh, dev boards, mostly from the same vendor. But it can be a great experience and can help you gain a deeper understanding of Android operating system. That brings us to the end of this session. Uh, the summary or the key takeaways from this talk is that running AOSP on dev boards or maintaining dev boards inside of AOSP can be complex and challenging process, but it also brings a wide range of, a wide range of benefits and have often proved to be an essential tool in the AOSP development process and serving as reference platform for Android device manufacturers. Do we have any questions? Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have a question regarding to WebView and Chromium, that what is your strategy supporting and updating or keeping inside of your builds? Do you just take the binary that's part of the upstream or you also focusing on maybe you know, some, some regressions and, 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 and aligning to Chromium releases, which may not necessarily align with the AOSP pace of, of doing things, specifically that there are lots of hardware interdependencies between WebView and coders and decoders, so things just can naturally break there as well. Right. So we tend to go with what is already provided, the binary which is already provided in AOSP external project. But there have been cases, uh, for example, the recent one is the memfd. Right? So if you don't want to use ashmem, which is deprecated upstream, and if you want to use memfd interface instead, then when we started looking into that, uh, the Chromium was broken. The Chromium binary was broken. Not the Chromium was not broken. The binary which was shipped as part of AOSP was broken. So we raised the concern upstream that the Chromium which is being shipped in AOSP is broken. And I could not reproduce the breakage with the upstream Chromium version. So they were glad to respin the binaries and update the binaries which are there in the external project. So I hope that answers your question, right? That if you, if you run into breakages like this, we just report it upstream. Yeah. Because uh, in AOSP is a huge set of projects and my understanding of code base is limited to what I have touched so far. And the moment I get to work on different, different subsystems, my first response is ask the developer what is going on. Instead of burning your own hands and then finding it out the hard way, it's easier to get help. Thank you so much. 
So we mentioned that uh, the DT nodes and the CSFS nodes are not stable, uh, I mean, it's not considered stable ABI. Do you mean that the device names in CSFS are not stable? Uh, so I can give you one specific example, right? So the Qualcomm board specific example. So the, I think CSFS, CIS uh, device platform, and they changed from SOC to SOC zero some time back, I think 5.4 that was. Right? So that broke all of our SE Linux policies because the path which you were specifying. So SE Linux does the, so SE Linux provides the access control at the device files levels, right? So you have to specify that, okay, if one particular uh, binary is trying to access this path, then allow it or don't allow it. Now, if that path gets changed when you update the kernel version, then that breaks uh, SE Linux and it's like a hard dependency. You cannot, uh, I mean, you have to boot with enforcing mode. Yeah, indeed, this is not an API, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. So, I, so we have discussed it uh, over the years and we understand that it's not an API. So if it changes, then you have to change it. So it's just like adding uh, one more line in the uh, SE Linux rules, so. Thanks for the insights. So what dev board would you currently recommend? I, uh, so I'm wearing a Linaro hat right now. I don't know if uh, I should be recommending any dev boards. So the dev board, so uh, I know that, uh, so the dev board vendors, right? Mlogic does a fantastic job. Sorry, Bailey does a fantastic job in maintaining Mlogic devices in AOSP. Uh, few beagles nowadays they are supporting the new one uh, if uh, i mean we do support dev boards as well uh, qualcomm dragon board 45 c uh, rb5 uh, the newer ones are hard to come by and we are not officially supporting them the newer dev kits uh, but the problem is that these dev boards are getting expensive i mean it's not like playing with raspberry pis or I don't know the price point of Beagle boards nowadays, but they used to be cheaper back in 10 years, 11 years ago. So, right, so there are dev board vendors, uh, Bailey Bray. I don't know if Bootlin does that or not. Uh, so Bailey Bray and Lenaro, I suppose. There may be others. I mean, I'm uh, outdated on that information. So if I could just do a quick follow-up from that then. So in Android 14, there's been uh, a bit of a tidy up of the dev board supported in AOSP. So I think quite a few have been kicked out. So do you have a view as to which dev boards will be in 14? Dragon board will be one, I think. So I know that Dragon board and RB5 are still there. I know that, uh, the so I, I don't know if I'm uh, the good person to talk on this right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I have a question regarding to Android BP files, and I don't have the right answer, and I've been struggling with that. So moving from Android MKs to Android BPs, we are quite limited when it comes to hacking in all kind of build flags into I totally the get Android, yes. Android BPs. One of the most challenging things I found is that if you support multiple boards in some of the sub projects, you actually want to enable some features like I want to have this feature on this board, but you don't want to actually hard code that into the Android BP files. So I ended up writing plugins for the BP you know, subsystems to be able to propagate uh, certain flags to sub projects to, you know, maintain like a nice structure of it. Do you have a take on that? How to support like a board specific feature with Android BP, but still having like a, you know, not too many hard coded uh, make files, uh, make file uh, configurations in the BP. I, I mean, I totally get your point that supporting multiple devices was a lot easier with MK files, right? couple of build flags you add in your device config and android.mk will take care of that. Uh, but the pain point was namespaces, right? If you have two projects which uses the same uh, project name, then the build will fail. I mean, 
right, with android.mk files. But with Blueprint files, you can specify the namespaces. In your config file, you can uh, import which project you want to import. Now, coming back to uh, hacking Blueprint files, I've been to the same thing uh, recently. If, uh, I have to add a C flag, just a C flag, right? That if there's a config uh, I have, I'm updating, and if I'm running on a specific board, and if so, just enable this flag. I do end up looking into the what you, modular properties. I think that's what it is called, that you have to uh, import the module, the android.bp module, add the property which you want to add. It could be anything, right? Properties are like uh, project-specific thing. So I added a C flag property, and it was working. Uh, it was working fine, but then I realized that the project, the upstream project, and uh, it was mini GBM, right? So uh, external mini GBM is not a. It doesn't define a namespace. So uh, first thing is that you cannot import a project BP file if it doesn't define a namespace. So that was the first blocker, right? So I said, okay, let's define a namespace. So I hacked the external mini GBM project, added a namespace there. But the moment I did that, the other projects which were using mini GBM but were not importing the uh, namespace, they were failing. They were crashing, right? And these are just the AOSP projects. I don't know how many out of AOSP projects are doing that. So if I update mini GBM and add a namespace, I can take care of AOSP projects, but I cannot take care of other n number of projects which might be using mini GBM the way it is right now. So I totally get your point. Whatever you're trying to do, I did the same thing, but I got stuck at the namespaces and I can modify that. And if I fix it in AOSP, then AOSP will be happier to take that patch as well. But I did not want to break other non AOSP projects. Yeah, yeah, we ended up writing a custom plugin because adding that namespace just kind of went out of control yes, how, many, yes. how many projects you have it to can, modify just can. for a single flag. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, uh, but the questions can be carried forward to the hallway. Sure, thank you.